Section 23 of Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. Isola. The next we saw was Isola, and we left on our right hand the Isle of San Giovanni, and so sailing by another small town built also on an island, we arrived at night at Margazzo, an obscure village at the end of the lake and at the very foot of the Alps, which now rise as it were suddenly after some hundreds of miles of the most even country in the world, and where there is hardly a stone to be found as if nature had here swept up the rubbish of the earth in the Alps to form and clear the plains of Lombardy, which had hitherto passed since our coming from Venice. In this wretched place I lay on a bed stuffed with leaves, which made such a crackling and did so prick my skin through the tick that I could not sleep. The next morning I was furnished with an ass, for we could not get horses. Instead of stirrups we had ropes tied with a loop to put our feet in, which supplied the place of other trappings. Thus, with my gallant steed, bridled with my Turkish present, we passed through a reasonably pleasant but very narrow valley, till we came to Duomo, where we rested and having showed the Spanish pass, the governor would press another on us, that his secretary might get a crown. Here we exchanged our asses for mules, sure-footed on the hills and precipices, being accustomed to pass them. Hiring a guide, we were brought that night through very steep, craggy and dangerous passages to a village called Vedra, being the last of the King of Spain's dominions in the Duchy of Milan. We had a very infamous, wretched lodging. The next morning we mounted again through strange, horrid and fearful crags and tracts, abounding in pine trees, and only inhabited by bears, wolves and wild goats. Nor could we anywhere see above a pistol shot before us, the horizon being terminated with rocks and mountains, whose tops, covered with snow, seemed to touch the skies, and in many places pierced the clouds. Some of these vast mountains were but one entire stone, between whose clefts now and then precipitated great cataracts of melted snow and other waters, which made a terrible roaring, echoing from the rocks and cavities and these waters in some places breaking in the fall wet us as if we had passed through a mist so as we could neither see nor hear one another but trusting to our honest mules we jogged on our way the narrow bridges in some places made only by felling huge fir trees and laying them athwart from mountain to mountain over cataracts of stupendous depth are very dangerous and so are the passages and edges made by cutting away the main rock, others in steps, and in some places we pass between mountains that have been broken and fallen on one another, which is very terrible, and one had need of a sure foot and steady head to climb some of these precipices, besides that they are harbours for bears and wolves who have sometimes assaulted travellers. In these straits we frequently alighted, now freezing in the snow, and anon frying by the reverberation of the sun against the cliffs as we descend lower, when we meet now and then a few miserable cottages, so built upon the declining of the rocks, as one would expect their sliding down. Among these inhabit a goodly sort of people, having monstrous gullets or wens of flesh growing to their throats, some of which I have seen as big as a hundred-pound bag of silver hanging under their chins, among the women especially, and that so ponderous, as that to ease them many wear linen cloth bound about their head, and coming under the chin to support it, but quis tu midum guto mirator in alpibus. Their drinking so much snow-water is thought to be the cause of it, the men using more wine are not so strumous as the women. The truth is, they are a peculiar race of people, and many great water drinkers here have not these prodigious tumours. It runs, as we say, in the blood, and is a vice in the race, and renders them so ugly, shrivelled and deformed, 
by its drawing the skin of the face down, that nothing can be more frightful. To this add a strange puffing dress, furs, and that barbarous language being a mixture of corrupt High German, French and Italian. The people are of great stature, extremely fierce and rude, yet very honest and trusty. Mount Sampion this night, through almost inaccessible heights, we came in prospect of Mons Sepronius, now Mount Sampion, which has on its summit a few huts and a chapel. Approaching this, Captain Ray's water spaniel, a huge filthy cur that had followed him out of England, hunted a herd of goats down the rocks into a river made by the melting of the snow. Arrived at our cold harbour, though the house had a stove in every room, and supping on cheese and milk with wretched wine, we went to bed in cupboards so high from the floor that we climbed them by a ladder. We were covered with feathers, that is, we lay between two ticks stuffed with them, and all little enough to keep one warm. The ceilings of the rooms are strangely low for those tall people, the house was now, in September, half covered with snow, nor is there a tree or a bush growing within many miles. From this uncomfortable place we prepared to hasten away the next morning, but as we were getting on our mules comes a huge young fellow demanding money for a goat which he affirmed that Captain's raised dog had killed. Expostulating the matter and impatient of staying on the cold, we set spurs and endeavoured to ride away, when a multitude of people being by this time gotten together about us, for it being Sunday morning and attending for the priest to say mass, they stopped our mules, beat us off our saddles, and disarming us of our carbines, drew us into one of the rooms of our lodging and set a guard upon us. Thus we continued prisoners till mass was ended, and then came half a score grim Swiss, who, taking on them to be magistrates, sat down on the table and condemned us to pay a pistol for the goat and ten more for attempting to ride away, threatening that if we did not pay it speedily they would send us to prison and keep us to a day of public justice where, as they perhaps would have exaggerated the crime, for they pretended we had primed our carbines and would have shot some of them, as indeed the captain was about to do, we might have had our heads cut off, as we were told afterward, for that among these rude people a very small misdemeanour does often meet that sentence. Though the proceedings appeared highly unjust, on consultation among ourselves we thought it safer to rid ourselves out of their hands and the trouble we were brought into, and therefore we patiently laid down the money and with fierce countenances had our mules and arms delivered to us and glad we were to escape as we did. This was cold entertainment, but our journey after was colder, the rest of the way having been, as they told us, covered with snow since the creation. No man remembered it to be without, and because, by the frequent snowing, the tracks are continually filled up, we pass by several tall masts set up to guide travellers, so as for many miles they stand in ken of one another, like to our beacons. In some places, where there is a cleft between two mountains, the snow fills it up, while the bottom being thawed leaves, as it were, a frozen arch of snow and that so hard as to bear the greatest weight. For as it snows often, so it perpetually freezes, of which I was so sensible that it floored the very skin of my face. Beginning now to descend a little, Captain Ray's horse, that was our sumpter and carried all our baggage, plunging through a bank of loose snow, slid down a frightful precipice, which so incensed the choleric cavalier, his master, that he was sending a brace of bullets into the poor beast, lest our guide should recover him and run away with his burden. But, just as he was lifting up his carbine, we gave such a shout, and so pelted the horse with snowballs, as with all his might plunging through the snow, he fell from another steep place into another bottom, near a path we were to pass. It was yet a good while ere we got to him, but at last we recovered the place, and easing him of his charge, 
hauled him out of the snow, where he had been certainly frozen in if we had not prevented it before night. It was, as we judged, almost two miles that he had slid and fallen, yet without any other harm than the benumbing of his limbs for the present, but with lusty rubbing and chafing he began to move, and after a little walking performed his journey well enough. All this way, affrighted with the disaster of this horse, we trudged on foot, driving our mules before us. Sometimes we fell, sometimes we slid through this ocean of snow, which after October is impassable. Toward night we came into a larger way, through vast woods of pines, which clothe the middle parts of these rocks. Here they were burning some to make pitch and rosin, peeling the knotty branches, as we do to make charcoal, reserving what melts from them which hardens into pitch. We passed several cascades of dissolved snow that had made channels of formidable depth in the crevices of the mountains, and with such a fearful roaring as we could hear it for seven long miles. It is from these sources that the Rhone and the Rhine, which pass through all France and Germany, derive their originals. Late at night we got to a town called Briga, at the foot of the Alps in the Valtelline. Almost every door had nailed on the outside, and next to the street a bear's, wolf's or fox's head, and diverse of them all three. A savage kind of sight, but as the Alps were full of the beasts, the people often kill them. The next morning we returned to our guide and took fresh mules, and another to conduct us to the Lake of Geneva, passing through as pleasant a country as that we had just travelled was melancholy and troublesome. A strange and sudden change it seemed, for the reverberation of the sunbeams from the mountains and rocks that like walls ranged on both sides, not above two flight shots to breadth, for a very great number of miles, renders the passage excessively hot. Through such extremes we continued our journey, that goodly river the Rhone gliding by us in a narrow and quiet channel almost in the middle of this canton, fertilising the country for grass and corn, which grow here in abundance. Sion We arrived this night at Sion, a pretty town and city, a bishop's seat, and the head of Valesia. There is a castle, and the bishop who resides in it has both civil and ecclesiastical jurisdiction. Our host, as the custom of these cantons is, was one of the chiefest of the town, and had been a colonel in France. He treated us with extreme civility, and was so displeased at the usage we received at Mount Sampion, that he would needs give us a letter to the governor of the country, who resided at St. Maurice, which was in our way to Geneva, to revenge the affront. This was a true old blade, and had been a very curious virtuoso, as we found by a handsome collection of books, medals, pictures, shells, and other antiquities. He showed two heads and horns of the true Capricorn, which animal, he told us, was frequently killed among the mountains. One branch of them was as much as I could well lift, and near as high as my head, not much unlike the greater sort of goats, save that they bent forward, by help whereof they climb up and hang on inaccessible rocks, from whence the inhabitants now and then shoot them. They speak prodigious things of their leaping from crag to crag, and of their sure footing, notwithstanding their being cloven-footed, unapt, one would think, to take hold and walk so steadily on those horrible ridges as they do. The colonel would have given me one of these beams, but the want of a convenience to carry it along with me caused me to refuse his courtesy. He told me that in the castle there were some Roman and Christian antiquities, and he had some inscriptions in his own garden. He invited us to his country house, where he said he had better pictures and other rarities, but our time being short, I could not persuade my companions to stay and visit the places he would have had us see, nor the offer he made to show us the hunting of the bear, wolf, and other wild beasts. The next morning, having presented his daughter, 
a pretty, well-fashioned young woman, with a small ruby ring, we parted somewhat late from our generous host. Passing through the same pleasant valley, between the horrid mountains and either canned, like a gallery many miles in length, we got to Martigny, where also we were well entertained. The houses in this country are all built of fir boards, planed within, low, and seldom above one story. The people very clownish and rustically clad, after a very odd fashion, for the most part in blue cloth, very whole and warm, with little variety of distinction between the gentleman and the common sort, by law of their country being exceedingly frugal. Add to this their great honesty and fidelity, though exacting enough for what they part with, I saw not one beggar. We paid the value of twenty shillings English for a day's hire of one horse. Every man goes with a sword by his side, the whole country well disciplined, and indeed impregnable, which made the Romans have such ill success against them. One lusty Swiss at their narrow passages is sufficient to repel a legion. It is a frequent thing here for a young tradesman or farmer to leave his wife and children for twelve or fifteen years and seek his fortune in the wars in Spain, France, Italy or Germany and then return again to work. I look upon this country to be the safest spot of all Europe neither envied nor envying, nor are any of them rich nor poor. They live in great simplicity and tranquillity, and though of the fourteen cantons half be Roman Catholics, the rest are formed, yet they mutually agree in a confederate with Geneva, and are its only security against its potent neighbours, as they themselves are from being attacked by the greater potentates, by the mutual jealousy of their neighbours, as either of them will be overbalanced, should the Swiss, who are wholly mercenary and auxiliaries, be subjected to France or Spain. We now arrived at St. Maurice, a large, handsome town and residence of the President, where justice is done. To him we presented our letter from Sion, and made known the ill usage we had received for killing a wretched goat, which so incensed him that he swore if he would stay he would not only help us to recover our money again, but most severely punish the whole rabble. But our desire of revenge had by this time subsided, and glad we were to be gotten so near France, which we reckoned as good as home. He courteously invited us to dine with him, but we excused ourselves, and returning to our inn, while we were eating something before we took horse, the governor had caused two pages to bring us a present of two great vessels of covered plate, full of excellent wine, in which we drank his health, and rewarded the youths. They were two vast bowls, supported by two Swiss, handsomely wrought after the German manner. This civility, and that of our host at Sion, perfectly reconciled us to the Highlanders, and so, proceeding on our journey, we passed this afternoon through the gate which divides the valet from the Duchy of Savoy, into which we were now entering, and so through Monte. We arrived that evening at Beveretta. Being extremely weary and complaining of my head, and finding little accommodation in the house, I caused one of our hostess's daughters to be removed out of her bed, and went immediately into it while it was yet warm, being so heavy with pain and drowsiness that I would not stay to have the sheets changed. But I shortly after paid dearly for my impatience, falling sick of the smallpox as, as soon as I came to Geneva, for by the smell of frankincense and the tale the good woman told me of her daughter having had an ague, I afterward concluded she had been newly recovered of the smallpox. Notwithstanding this, I went with my company the next day, hiring a bark to carry us over the lake, and indeed, sick as I was, the weather was so serene and bright, the water so calm, and the air so temperate, that never had travellers a sweeter passage. Thus we sailed the whole length of the lake, about thirty miles, the countries bordering on it, Savoy and Bern, affording one of the most delightful prospects in the world. 
the Alps covered with snow, though at a great distance, yet showing their aspiring tops. Through this lake the river Rodanus passes with that velocity as not to mingle with its exceeding deep waters, which are very clear and breed the most celebrated trout for largeness and goodness of any in Europe. I have ordinarily seen one of three feet in length sold in the market for a small price, and such we had in the lodging where we abode, which was at the White Cross. All this while I held up tolerably, and the next morning, having a letter for Signor John Diodati, the famous Italian minister and translator of the Holy Bible into that language, I went to his house and had a great deal of discourse with that learned person. He told me he had been in England, driven by tempest into Deal, while sailing for Holland, that he had seen London, and was exceedingly taken with the civilities he received. He so much approved of our church government by bishops, that he told me the French Protestants would make no scruple to submit to it and all its pomp, had they a king of the reformed religion as we had. He exceedingly deplored the difference now between His Majesty and the Parliament. After dinner came one Monsieur Saladin, with his little pupil, the Earl of Carnarvon, to visit us, offering to carry us to the principal places of the town. But being now no more able to hold up my head, I was constrained to keep my chamber, imagining that my very eyes would have dropped out and this night I felt such a stinging about me that I could not sleep. In the morning I was very ill, but sending for a doctor, he persuaded me to be bled. He was a very learned old man, and, as he said, he had been physician to Gustavus the Great, King of Sweden, when he passed this way into Italy under the name of Monsieur Gars, the initial letters of Gustavus Adolphus Rex Suecii and of our famous Duke of Buckingham on his returning out of Italy. He afterward acknowledged that he should not have bled me had he suspected the smallpox which broke out a day after. He afterward purged me and applied leeches, and God knows what this would have produced if the spots had not appeared, for he was thinking of bleeding me again. They now kept me warm in bed for sixteen days, tended by a vigilant Swiss matron, whose monstrous throat, when I sometimes awakened out of unquiet slumbers, would have fright me. After the pimples were come forth, which were not many, I had much ease as to pain, but infinitely afflicted with heat and noisomeness. By God's mercy, after five weeks keeping my chamber, I went abroad. Monsieur Saladin and his lady sent me many refreshments. Monsieur Le Chat, my physician, to excuse his letting me bleed, told me it was so burnt and vicious that it would have proved the plague, or spotted fever, had he proceeded by any other method. On my recovering sufficiently to go abroad, I dined at Monsieur Saladin's, and in the afternoon went across the water on the side of the lake, and took a lodging that stood exceedingly pleasant, about half a mile from the city, for the better airing but I stayed only one night, having no company there, save my pipe. So the next day I caused them to row me about the lake as far as the great stone, which they call Neptune's Rock, on which they say sacrifice was anciently offered to him. Thence I landed at certain cherry gardens and pretty villas by the side of the lake, and exceedingly pleasant. Returning, I visited their conservatories of fish, in which were trouts of six and seven feet long, as they affirmed. The Rhone, which parts the city in the midst, dips into a cavern underground about six miles from it, and afterward rises again and runs its open course, like our mole or swallow by Dorking in Surrey. The next morning, being Thursday, I heard Dr. Diodati preach in Italian, many of that country, especially of Lucca, his native place, being inhabitants of Geneva and of the reformed religion. The town lying between Germany, France and Italy, those three tongues are familiarly spoken by the inhabitants. It is a strong, well-fortified city, part of it built on a rising ground. The houses are not despicable, 
but the high penthouses, for I can hardly call them cloisters, being all of wood, through which the people pass dry and in the shade, winter and summer, exceedingly deform the fronts of the buildings. Here are abundance of booksellers, but their books are of ill impressions. These, with watches of which store are made here, crystal and excellent screwed guns, are the staple commodities. All provisions are good and cheap. The townhouse is fairly built of stone. The portico has four black marble columns, and on a table of the same under the city arms, a demi-eagle and cross, between cross keys, is a motto post tenebras lux, and this inscription, Quo Mano 1535, Profligata Romana Antichristi Tyrannide Abrogatisqui. Eio superstitionibus sacrosancta Christi religio hic in suam puritatem, inclesiae in meliorem ordinem singulari dei beneficio reposita, et simul pulsis fugatisque hostibus urbs ipsa in suam libertatem non sine in signi miraculo restituta furit. Senatus populesqui genavenis sis monumentum, hoc perpetuae memoriae, causa fieri atqui, hot loco erigi curavit quod suam erga, deem gratitudinem ad posteros testatum furit. The territories about the town are not so large as many ordinary gentlemen have about their country farms for which cause they are in continual watch, especially on the Savoy side. But in case of any siege, the Swiss are at hand, as this inscription in the same place shows, toward the street. D.O.M.S. Anno a vera religione divinitus cum veteri, libertate geneva restituta, et quasi novo jubileo in nunte plurimus vitatis domi et forci insidiis et superatis tempestatibus, et cum helvortiorum primari tugurini equo jure in sociatem perpetuam nobiscum venerint, et veteres fidissimi socii benensis prius vinculum nova ad strinxerint, SPQG, quod felix esse velit, DOM, tanti beneficii monumentum consecrarunt anno temporis ultimi, CCO 10XXX1V. In the Senate House were fourteen ancient urns, dug up as they were removing earth in the fortification. A little out of the town is a spacious field which they call Campus Martius, and well it may be so termed with better reason than that at Rome at present, which is no more a field, but all built into streets. For here on every Sunday after the evening devotions, this precise people permit their youth to exercise arms and shoot in guns and in the long and cross bows, in which they are exceedingly expert, reputed to be as dexterous as any people in the world. To encourage this, they yearly elect him who has won most prizes at the mark to be their king, as the king of the longbow, gun or crossbow. He then wears that weapon in his hat in gold, with a crown over it made fast to the hat like a brooch. In this field is a long house, wherein their arms and furniture are kept in several places very neatly. To this joins a hall, where at certain times they meet and feast. In the glass windows are the arms and names of their kings. At the side of the field is a very noble pall mall, but it turns with an elbow. There is also a bowling place, a tavern, and a tray table, and here they ride their managed horses. It is also the usual place of public execution of those who suffer for any capital crime, though committed in another country, by which law diverse fugitives have been put to death, who have fled hither to escape punishment in their own country. Among other severe punishments here, adultery is death. Having seen this field and played a game at Mal, I supped with Mr. Saladine. On Sunday I heard Dr. Diodati preach in French, 
and after the French mode, in a gown with a cape and his hat on. The church government is severely Presbyterian after the discipline of Calvin and Beza, who set it up but nothing so rigid as either our Scots or English sectaries of that denomination. In the afternoon, Monsieur Maurice, a most learned young person, an excellent poet, chief professor of the university, preached at St. Peter's, a spacious Gothic fabric. This was heretofore a cathedral and a reverent pile. It has four turrets, on one of which stands a continual sentinel, in another canons are mounted. The church is very decent within, nor have they at all defaced the painted windows, which are full of pictures of saints, nor the stools, which are all carved with the history of our blessed Saviour. In the afternoon I went to see the young townsmen exercise in Mars Field, where the prizes were pewter plates and dishes. It is said that some have gained competent estates by what they have thus won. Here I first saw huge ballistae or crossbows shot in, being such as they were formerly used in wars, before great guns were known. They were placed in frames and had great screws to bend them, doing execution at an incredible distance. They were most accurate at the longbow and musket, rarely missing the smallest mark. I was as busy with the carbine I brought from Brescia as any of them. After every shot I found them go into a long house and cleanse their guns before they charged again. On Monday I was invited to a little garden without the works, where were many rare tulips, anemones and other choice flowers. The Rhone running athwart the town out of the lake makes half the city a suburb, which, in imitation of Paris, they call Saint-Germain's Folksburg, and it has a church of the same name. On two wooden bridges that cross the river are several water mills and shops of trades, especially smiths and cutlers. Between the bridges is an island, in the midst of which is a very ancient tower, said to have been built by Julius Caesar. At the end of the other bridge is the mint and a fair sundial. Passing again by the townhouse, I saw a large crocodile hanging in chains, and against the wall of one of the chambers, seven judges were painted without hands, except one in the middle who has but one hand. I know not the story. The arsenal is at the end of this building, well furnished and kept. After dinner, Mr. Morris led us to the college, a fair structure. In the lower part are the schools, which consists of nine classes and a hall above where the students assemble, also a good library. They showed us a very ancient Bible of about three hundred years old in the vulgar French, and a manuscript in the old monkish character. Here have the professors their lodgings. I also went to the hospital, which is very commodious, but the bishop's palace is now a prison. This town is not much celebrated for beautiful women, for even at this distance from the Alps the gentlewomen have somewhat full throats. But our Captain Ray, afterwards Sir William, eldest son of their, that Sir Christopher, who had both been in arms against His Majesty for the Parliament, fell so mightily in love with one of Monsieur Saladin's daughters, that with much persuasion he could not be prevailed on to think on his journey into France, the season now coming on extremely hot. My sickness and abode here cost me forty-five pistols of gold to my host and five to my honest doctor, who for six weeks' attendance and the apothecary thought it so generous a reward that at my taking leave he presented me with his advice for the regimen of my health written with his own hand in Latin. The regimen I much observed, and I bless God, passed the journey without inconvenience from sickness. But it was an extraordinarily hot, unpleasant season and journey by reason of the craggy ways. End of section 23